I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when she I... She says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Can't Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing the... Well, I grew up near Big Springs, Nebraska, way out in the western part of the state, last town before you get into Colorado, actually. I lived there until I was 18 and went off to college, and uh, then I've lived in lots of places since then, but I came back to Nebraska to stay in 1979, live presently at Crete, Nebraska. I teach at the University of Nebraska on kind of a part-time basis. I teach some uh, senior level and graduate courses in management. And uh, I do a good many programs in schools around the state, but also in other states, too. Well, they've had a good deal of influence, particularly with regard to three books, as well as a nationally syndicated column that I wrote. I um, was living in Illinois, not in Nebraska, but a woman that was the editor of a small-town newspaper there, she had grown up in Wahoo, asked me to write a column for her, and so I started to do that, and it eventually resulted in uh, about 200 papers around the country carrying it, and uh, resulted in three books. Well, what I did was create a fictional town. Actually, it was based on where I grew up in Nebraska. The town's called Marlowe's Gap. And the people do funny things, but uh, they're pretty good people, pretty good set of values. And so that uh, Nebraska experience influenced me a great deal with regard to that particular writing. I think the person most significant uh, with regard to my writing has been my grandmother. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents, and my grandmother uh, read all the time and caused me to have a, a very uh, great uh, love of reading, but also uh, I was impressed by authors. And I still can tell you a great deal about every author I read when I was young, from uh, uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt to Agatha Christie to so on. And uh, my grandmother encouraged me in that direction, and she, uh, she uh, was a uh, believer that I could be a writer. I know that when I was in my 20s, I had a great deal of uh, desire to be a writer, and I wrote a good many things that I sent off to New York publishers and got them all rejected. And uh, then I finally, in 1972, had a book, a juvenile novel, accepted. And that's when I thought, well, I, I can get something accepted at least. I uh, am rather eclectic with regard to what I write. I write a good many different kinds of things. But uh, I suppose the thing that inspires me the most is uh, humor. I, uh, I like to write uh, things that are funny, I guess. Uh, and so if I see something I think is humorous, is funny, I go to the computer and sit down and try to put something down about that. I would say in very many different venues, although three of the books that I've written have been from the Marlowe's Gap column, so maybe that's what I've gravitated toward the most. I um, had a good deal of uh, fun and uh, and really a, a good deal of reward in writing my latest book, The Outsiders, because of the people I met, the people I got acquainted with and talked to in doing that book. Well, you know, I write uh, at a computer now because I like the fact that I can move things around if I want to. And uh, I don't have any scheduled hours that I write, really. And I probably should, because I'm a procrastinator and I don't get as much writing done as I really should. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I'm not um, teaching and not out uh, giving programs, then I sit down at the computer and do some writing. Usually about uh, every week I, I do some, but not necessarily every day. Well, you know, I write so many different kinds of things that I don't know that I do have any particular writing style. 
with regard to uh, voice, I, uh, I write most things in third person, but uh, not all. I'm trying to do a book now where part of it is in third person and part in first person. I don't know if that's going to work or not. The audience that I wrote for with regard to the nationally syndicated column and the books that came from that, essentially older people, I suppose. I um, do sell a good many of those books if I do programs in rural communities because they identify with the things that I write about there. Now, um, with the outsiders, I suppose that I wrote for schools, uh, high schools maybe, with, rego with regard to multicultural studies, but um, I just recently sold a hundred of those books to be used to give to refugees who have come to Lincoln. That people can do funny things, but they can also be very, very good people, that they can have a very good set of values. And uh, that really is the uh, theme of all those books, that uh, people uh, may be a little eccentric and, and such, but they're generally pretty good neighbors and willing to do quite a bit for other people. And it's based on a rural community, but I think it's probably true in cities too, as we've seen recently with regard to New York City. Well, I would say that it's difficult to get uh, <laughs> things accepted, but not impossible. And uh, you may get uh, 30 or 40 rejections, you know, before you have one acceptance, but not impossible at all. I would say that if you're going to go with a New York publisher, you probably need to get an agent, and it's sometimes difficult to persuade an agent to be your agent, but not impossible again there either. And then I think that there are regional publishers that uh, do serve uh, a, a good purpose here, that you might get something published with a regional publisher, which then may transcend and transform itself into a national kind of thing at, at some point. Well, I uh, am working on uh, major novels now. I don't know whether I'll get those accepted or not, but they have to do with current uh, kinds of themes that we see in the news, bullying for one thing. And uh, I uh, have a granddaughter that's quite interested in writing too, and I'd like to help her to get going with that. Well. I probably will talk about two books tonight. Uh, one is Country Tales and Truths, and that is based on that uh, column that I've mentioned before, and uh, came to be primarily because of the lady in Illinois who wanted me to write about rural things. And then I may read uh, some from The Outsiders. The Outsiders is a book that uh, came to be because my friend Murtaza Chedyev from Lincoln's sister city of Hojent in Tajikistan suggested that people have difficulty adjusting to alien cultures. And I said, well, that's right. And so we decided we would interview people to find out the kinds of challenges, the kinds of opportunities that they had found in changing cultures. My name is Carol Connor, and I'm the library director. And I want to welcome you to the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors and the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting Nebraska authors. Currently, we have a collection of 11,000 items, volumes, written by more than th uh, 3,000 published authors from Nebraska. In an effort to promote the works of the Nebraska authors, we sponsor the uh, Ames Reading Series to bring the audience and the authors together in one place for readings and for discussion. Our reader this evening is, Rich, is Richard Kimbrough, who grew up on a small farm near Big Spring, Nebraska, and has lived in many places, both inside and outside the United States. His education includes experiences at many diverse areas as well, Kearney State, San Francisco State, the University of Miami, uh, the University of Maine, and Duke University. He's the author of 11 books, and his cross-country courage won the Friends of ne American Writers Distinguished Recognition Award in 1973. He currently teaches at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. 
Tonight he will read from two works. The Outsiders, a book he co-authored, which speaks to cultural ad adaptation here and abroad. He has an essay on his living experience and teaching experience in the republics of Central Asia, especially Tajikistan. The second book, Country Tales and Truths, are stories based on a fictional town, population 562, and that town is based on his living experience from um, Big Springs, Nebraska. Please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening. Well, I don't know exactly how much I'm going to read. Maybe I'll simply talk to you more if that's all right. Uh, Carol, I should ask you, is that all right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I will do that. You know, uh, the first thing I think that I'll talk to you about is a book that's called Country Tales and Truths. It's based on my experiences growing up in a rural community in Nebraska. I grew up near Big Springs, Nebraska, way out in the western part of the state. And uh, years and years later, when I was living in Illinois, the editor of a small-town newspaper asked me to write a column about uh, whatever I would like. And since this was a small-town newspaper, I thought maybe they'd like to hear about some of the people I remembered from my experience growing up in a rural community. So I created a fictional town, which is called Marlowe's Gap. And Marlowe's Gap uh, has 562 people. And the people uh, do funny things. Most of the stories are funny. But they're pretty good people with a pretty good set of values. And uh, <clears throat> so... Um, the column that I wrote really eventuated in three books, uh, the latest of which is Country Tales and Truths. There are two others that came before, Love Grows on Farms and uh, Country Love. And then uh, the other book that we're going to talk about tonight is The Outsiders, which is the most recent book that I've written in collaboration with a young man from the country of Tajikistan, former part of the part of the former Soviet Union his name is Murtazo Chedyev and uh, I'll tell you more about that afterwards but first of all I think I'll give you something from country tales and truths I'll tell you a little story or two from there and then I might read a little little bit from the book itself but there are certain characters in country tales and truths that repeat that are seen again and again and one of these fellows is Tully Wells. And I think that I will simply tell you about Tully's experience when he was down at the co-op. He, uh, he's about 85 years old. He's retired. He goes down to the co-op every day and sits in a big chair and sleeps most of the time, kind of like an old cat. But this particular day, he gets very distressed because he hears the man, he calls them boys, they're about 65, but uh, they are talking about who the greatest athlete ever was that came from Nebraska. And this bothers him because he is growing up in a community where he believes the greatest athlete came from. And uh, he, despite the fact he lives in Marlowe's Gap now, still, still, remembers this community where he grew up and still has a very considerable interest in it and the people that live there. It's a rural community, too. And so Tully does this. Now, Tully is 85, which is a little older than I am even, so he talks a little more like an older man, and he says, Well, boys, <clears throat> you're talking about the greatest person, sports person, ever to come from Nebraska. Well, I'll tell you who it was. It was old Pete. Now, you, you probably don't know old Pete. Well, he wasn't always old, Pete. Once he was young, Pete, and he could throw a baseball. He could throw it hard. But I tell you the best thing about him, if you put a tin cup on the barn door and you put him back 60 feet and 6 inches and you said put it in a cup, Pete, he'd do it every time. He'd do it every time. He knew just where that ball was going. He had control. And so uh, he was good, but nobody knew he was good because he just pitched for a, 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 a little old, town team there you know and 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 they just played out in the pasture 
until there was a team from Illinois came through, what you call a barnstorming team, and uh, they uh, played uh, Pete's team, and uh, one of their players saw how good he was, and he wrote to a friend that he had in Galesburg, Illinois, and said, there is a kid in Nebraska who could pitch for you now. He's good. And the manager at Galesburg wrote to Pete, and he said, I give you $5 a week, and I give you your your room and your board, and, and, and you would be in organized baseball. And Pete thought that was pretty good. And so he went back there to Galesburg to pitch, and the first game he pitched, he won, and the second game he pitched, he won, and the third game he pitched, he won, but the fourth game he pitched, that is where there was the accident. There was an accident. You see, he, he was the runner on first base, and he, he, he was not a good base runner. And, and the batter hit a ball down to shortstop, and the shortstop gloved it, and he threw to second. There was one out, and the second baseman turned to throw to first for the double play, and Pete did not slide. And the ball got him right here, and he was unconscious for 58 straight hours. And when he came to, he was all right, except for one thing. He saw two of everything. He saw a double. And he could still throw the ball as hard as ever, but he couldn't put it in a tin cup no more. And so the manager there at Galesburg saw he couldn't pitch, and he sold him to Indianapolis. And the manager at Indianapolis said, Now, Pete, I know how good you have to be, and, and, and you get on the mound and you throw it by me. Let's see you throw it by me. And Pete knew he had to throw it good, but he saw it too, like always. And he threw it hard, and he hit the manager there in the ribs, and he broke three of his ribs, and the manager's mad. He is mad. He, he says, You can't pitch. He said, that You... He, you go back to Nebraska and farm. That's all you can do. You go back to Nebraska and farm. And Pete went back to Nebraska and he did farm. He worked for a farmer. Every night when the chores are done, he'd, uh, he'd find somebody to be his catcher and he'd pitch for about half an hour. But he still saw double. He'd go to town on Saturday night and people would say to him, Pete, you still trying to be a pitcher? <clears throat> yeah, I am. You still see double? Yeah, I do. Pete, you just as well give up your dream. You just as well give it up because people that see double always see double. And Pete would say very quietly, I believe that someday the Lord will work a miracle and I will see just one. And so it was about a year later he was in the schoolyard and he looked down at the catcher and he saw two like always and then he reared back to pitch and right about there is when the Lord decided to work the miracle and he saw just one. Oh, we can skip a lot of time now. Go to when he's really old, Pete, 37 years old, which is old for a baseball pitcher. And his team was ahead of run, and the other team had two out, but they had the bases loaded, and the kid was coming to bat, and the kid could hit. Pete wasn't pitching that day. He'd pitched the day before. He'd won 10 to 2. He was out in the bullpen. And a manager came, and he took the ball away from Haynes, and he said, Haynes, you've done a good job, but I'm going to call for Pete now. And he waved out to the bullpen, and old Pete came in, and he gave the ball to him, and he said, Pete, look at the scoreboard. His team was ahead of run. The other team had two out. He said, now, look at the bases, Pete. And Pete saw there was runners at every base, and he said, there's no place to put the kid, is there? Now there's no place to put him. Well, then we'll get him out. And he wound up, and he threw the first pitch to the kid, and the kid swung, and he missed, and it was strike one. And he threw the second pitch, and it was outside, one and one. And then he threw the third pitch to the kid, and the kid hit it 40 miles. I mean, he hit it 40 miles, but he hit it five feet foul, and it was strike two. And then he got ready to throw one more pitch to the kid. He looked at the scoreboard again, his team ahead a run, and the other team with two out. And he looked at the third base where Earl Combs led off. And he looked at second base where Lou Gehrig led off. And he looked at first base where the great Babe Ruth led off. And he threw one more pitch to Tony Lazari. And Lazari swung and he missed. And the St. Louis Cardinals had defeated the New York Yankees in the 1926 World Series. He was the greatest there ever was in the National League. He won more games than anyone before since he was the first man inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame. His name was Grover Cleveland Pete Alexander out of St. Paul, Nebraska. You could look it up. 
And so we wrote about people like Tully Wells that cared about the past and thought that maybe there had been great baseball players then. And we wrote about people like Esty Brace. Esty was the egg man at the co-op, and you couldn't always believe what Esty told you quite, but he counted eggs honest. He uh, said to the boys one that day, he said, you know, I saved the town from being destroyed. You know that? They said, you did, Esty? Yeah, I did. I saved it from being destroyed. Back in 35, I was out on the Tompkins place five miles west here mowing, mowing alfalfa hay with a horse-drawn mower. And you get to kind of daydreaming there, you know. And, and, and I was daydreaming. The horse is nowhere to go. And, and the sickle kind of puts you to sleep, just like that. And, 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 and I looked up all of a sudden, and there was a tornado coming right for town. It was going to come right for town. I could see it was going to hit town. Now, I wasn't worried about myself. I wasn't worried about myself at all. But, but I had to warn the people. I had to warn the people in town. And so I threw that more out of gear, and I galloped toward town. But you cannot outrun a tornado. And the tornado picked me up, and it picked the moor up, and it picked the horses up, and it was spinning us around in the air up there. And I wasn't worried about myself, but I could see it was going to hit the town, going to destroy the town. And, and then just in the nick of time, I remembered what to do. I remembered the tornado cannot go anywhere without its tail. And I threw that moor into gear, and that sickle cut off its tail, and I saved the town. And so there were people like Esty Brace, and there were all kinds of people in the town we might uh, read a little bit with regard to, to uh, uh, a couple of fellas that, uh, well, they're boys, actually. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. This uh, story is called Pipe Tonguing. Around Marlowe's Gap, as I'm sure is true in most other rural communities, the worst of the winter temptations was and still is putting your tongue on a cold water pipe. There were other temptations, of course, like mistletoe and sugar plums at Christmas, but none compared to pipe tonguing, sticking your tongue on that freezing water pipe, running from the windmill to the stock tank. If you grew up on a farm, you remember how it was. Your elders kept reminding you not to put your tongue on that pipe. Under no circumstances do you put your tongue on that pipe. Never tongue the pipe. Of course, those admonitions naturally made the temptation greater, since you had learned at an early age that forbidden pleasures are the best, like sipping from Grandpa's hard cider jug or kissing your cute classmate. By 13 or 14, challenges and dares are definitely your meat. So one frigid morning after you had broken the ice in the tank so that the cows could drink, you got to wondering what the great thrill was in tonguing a pipe. You were sorely tempted. You start first by moistening your mittened hand in the tank and laying it on the pipe. Fuzz from the mitten stuck to the pipe, and the urge grew to try more, so a forefinger was bared wet and gingerly touched to the pipe. Usually the pain accompanied the removal of the damp finger was sufficient to stop the laying on of the tongue. When Everett Kessler and Lester Grum were eighth graders in country school, they had a bad experience with pipe tonguing. Their classmate John Reinhardt was ex- excitable. Things alarmed John. He came by his skittishness naturally. His mother was, to use Grandma's expression, hasty as a hurried hare. You could have fun getting John worked up, so Lester and Everett decided to have some fun. John lived just a couple of yards, from, uh, just a couple of hundred yards from the school, so one very cold afternoon, Lester and Everett stopped to visit John after school, and they worked the conversation around a pipe tonguing. Lester boldly stated that he was willing to risk his tongue to the pipe. Everett, as had been planned, Double Dog dared him. Lester walked over, put his mittened hands around the pipe, and pretended to lower his lips right down onto that pipe. After a second, Everett asked, You got your tongue on it, Les? Les nodded slightly. Then in another minute, Lester began to kick his legs frantically and make horrible gargling noises. Scared to death, John squealed, Good guy, she stuck tight. The grums had butchered the day before. Lester had a fresh hog tongue concealed in his mitten, which unbeknownst to John, he had sneaked onto the pipe. With a sudden violent jerk, he wrenched his head away with the awful arg. 
clutched his hands to his mouth and ran off to the barn. John screamed and raced off to the house for his mother. Mrs. Reinhardt ran out, saw the tongue stuck to the pipe, hollered, I'll fetch the doctor, cranked the Model A, and flew off to town before she could be stopped. Trouble was, there wasn't any water in the car's radiator, and naturally it overheated and cracked the block. Everett Kessler said he learned quickly that he mustn't pipe tongue because it can lead to an overheated engine. Same with kissing your classmate. <clears throat> <laughs> so those were some of the kinds of stories that we wrote for Country Tales and Truths. Now the other book, The Outsiders, interviewed 33 people who had changed cultures. Now, some of them had moved from someplace else to the United States. Some had moved from the United States to someplace else. And a few had moved from one culture in America to another culture. Uh, among those, people like Leon Yellowcloud, who had moved from a reservation to the United States military and the kinds of difficulties he encountered there. Uh, people like Leola Bullock, that some of you may have met or may know of, still lives in Lincoln, still a very active, active civil rights leader. Uh, her, her experience moving from uh, the South to Lincoln when she was about 19 years old and first married and the difficulty she had in getting a job here in Lincoln and such. and. Uh, we had a set of questions that we gave all the interviewees. Now, they could expand on these if they wished. One thing that we asked all of them was about language barriers. And, of course, some of the stories we heard about language barriers were funny. Uh, some were not so funny, but some were, were quite funny, like uh, Tamur Kananatov. Tamor said he came to the United States and he hadn't been here very long when he went uh, home one evening to his host family and the host brother was home and he said, uh, Tamor, you know, uh, I haven't had much to eat today. Have you had anything to eat? Tamor said, no. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a $10 bill and you go out and get a pizza and step on it. <laughs> you see the problem? And Julie Nunez from Honduras she said she was in Miami, Florida, and uh, riding with her American friend. Pretty warm day. And so she said to the American friend, said to Julie, Julie, why don't you crack the window? And you see, there's a little problem there, too. Of course, it works both ways. I was at a hotel in Moscow, well, in, in Russia, not Moscow, but I was at a hotel in Russia, and somebody asked me how long I planned to be in this particular hotel. And I meant to say to them I, I was going to be there Monday and Tuesday. Ponidelnik is tornik in Russian. But I made a little mistake. I said panidori, not panidelnik, panidori is tornik, which means tomato and Tuesday. I'll be there tomato and Tuesday. And so uh, it works both ways. But sometimes, of course, the language barrier, as we learn from visiting with various people here, can be quite a, quite a barrier. Talk to Arturo Coto. Arturo Coto was the Minister of Health in El Salvador. He came home after World Health Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, to find out there had been a coup in his country, and he had to leave. And he got out, and he wound up living in Dix, Nebraska, population 283, out by Sydney. Now, the reason he lived there was because his daughter was an exchange student at Potter Dix, and the family wound up out there. Problem was that though he had been the top doctor in his country, he couldn't be a doctor in Nebraska because he couldn't speak English. So he hoed beans and he painted houses until he learned to speak English and managed to pass the tests in order to become a doctor. Today, he's one of the leading doctors with the uh, state health department, and so... Um, People overcome these things, but sometimes they can be quite distressing for a time. Now, we might uh, read just a tiny bit out of uh, this book. Uh, I think the uh, person that I'm going to read from is Dr. Ishmael Burhan, who came to this country from Afghanistan. And he uh, is the author 
of the definitive language text for people working in Afghanistan is called Dari for Foreigners. As you probably know from recent events, there are quite a number of languages that are spoken in Afghanistan, but probably the one spoken most, I guess, is Dari. And he says this, I grew up in Afghanistan in a home which embraced the major tenets of, Af of Afghan culture because the older person has had more experience, he must be obeyed. Because the parents have provided love and nurturing to their children, one son must live with the parents. Because young people are inexperienced in affairs of the heart, their parents must decide who shall marry whom. Because the father is responsible for the welfare of the family, he must do the budgeting for the household. Such are some of the beliefs of the culture. The American culture, well, as a youth, my impressions of America were formed by movies we saw and the novels we read about people of the United States. I grew up believing that all Americans were rich, that cowboys and Indians still battled, that mafia-type criminals were rife among the population. In short, while I viewed my Afghan culture as sane, reasonable, the way things ought to be, I viewed the American culture as strange, somewhat frightening even, as it was somewhat tempting, even as it was somewhat tempting in its obvious adventurousness. Then, as a member of the Agency for International Development, I came to New York to attend Teachers College, Columbia University. To my surprise, I found no Indians, no cowboys. And for that matter, I didn't find any mafia criminals bothering me. I found that most Americans were middle class and not rich. Most were faithful to their mates. Most were religious. Most were kind, and most were helpful. My point is that we often hold erroneous stereotypes of other cultures, that we need to withhold judgments of foreign cultures until we can learn more about them and ideally observe them firsthand. There's more to that, but uh, all of the folks had different kinds of ideas with regard to America, but some things seem to be pretty much the same. Many of the people who had come to America decried the fact that we don't seem as loving to our families as they thought we should. They said, in some cases, well, you warehouse your old people. You put them in warehouses. You don't take care of them. You should put them in your home. What is the matter with you Americans? Uh, not everyone said that, and they didn't know a great deal about uh, care homes in America, but... Uh, they had that concern. And then uh, a good many of the people mentioned that they had difficulty getting accustomed to American food. I had in 1993 a number of professors from Kyrgyzstan here, and I taught them English as a second language. And I asked them after they'd been here five months what they disliked most about America. And they said, the thing we dislike most is the food. The food is so very, very bad. Well, I went to Kyrgyzstan, and uh, I guess I would have said the same thing there. There was some food I liked, of course. I liked plov, uh, rice with uh, lamb and so on. I liked that. And they had some salads that were very good, and they have great arbus, uh, watermelon. But um, uh, one thing I didn't like was that a couple of times I was the oxycol, the oldest man at a gathering, and they would give me the head of the animal that was being eaten. I didn't like that too much. Al Gore went to open the school where I was the first American teacher, America, uh, Kyrgyz American University. And uh, so they had a big banquet for Al Gore and his wife, Tipper, and the president of the country, Oscar Kayev, and his wife were there and so on. And uh, they gave him the thing that they give every really honored guest to eat, which was a raw goat's eye. So sometimes the food is not exactly what you would want, you know, if you change a culture from one culture to another. Well, uh, do you folks, there are not many of us, so we can be kind of casual and such, do you have questions you'd like to ask uh, me? I've talked about two books that I've written. Uh, there's uh, others that I could visit with you about, too. Is that how we do this, Carol? Is to to let the folks ask questions. So go ahead. Don't be uh, don't be bashful. Go ahead and ask whatever you'd like to ask. The first book that you spoke on. Yeah. Is that the one that's based on a fictional town? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Marlowe's Gap. Yeah. I don't know if my my memory serves me right here, but.
how maybe would you compare that to, say, Lake Wobegon? Okay, yeah. It's uh, quite a bit like Lake Wobegon. I, um, it's quite a lot like Lake, Lake Wobegon, and then some of the stories are very much like Roger Welch's stories about uh, rural Nebraska and about the kinds of things that happen there. In fact, I think that in one of his books, he has a story very similar to the Esty Brace story that I told you uh, about uh, the tornado and so on. But uh, Garrison Keillor, I, I like Garrison Keillor a lot. I, I like him better on tapes than I do when I read the books, but I like him. And I think that he has a, a sensitivity toward the kind of people that lived in Lake Wobegon, and I hope I do toward the people that lived in Marlowe's Gap, you know. Yeah. Go ahead, other questions. What yeah. was Pete's real name? Oh, his real name was Grover Cleveland Alexander. Yeah, Alexander, Uh uh-huh. And that's a true story, except that Tully Wells probably has a couple of things a little wrong. But that's uh, understandable. Tully Wells is 85 years old, so, you know, he won't remember everything just quite the way it happened. It happened 1926. Uh, The thing he has wrong is probably he's got the base runners a little wrong. Ruth was not the runner on first base when Alexander struck out Lazari. But that other than that, it's pretty accurate. Uh, Alexander came in in the seventh inning, and that's where he struck out Lazari, and then he continued the rest of the game, and nothing happened with regard to the Yankees then. He was from uh, St. Paul, Nebraska, or Elba, Nebraska. Elba will claim him rather than St. Paul, but St. Paul has a big festival for him every year. And uh, he uh, he was a great pitcher. He won 373 games during his career, which is more than anybody else won in the National League. Ties with Christy Matheson and the New York Giants. But uh, the thing was about Alexander that he had a very difficult life. <clears throat> he was an alcoholic, and uh, he came back to St. Paul and people for many years when he was around there thought of him as kind of an old bum. But then they began to realize this guy was quite a quite a pitcher, and so now they have this uh, thing for him. But that's that's fine. It's good that he's honored these days. Yeah. What inspired you to, to write the Outsiders? Oh, the Outsiders. Well, what happened was that I had uh, I was in uh, Tajikistan, former Soviet Union, one day in 1994. A young man came into the Center for Entrepreneurship that UNL had established there, and uh, he uh, couldn't speak English very well, but uh, with the English he could speak and the limited Russian that I could speak, he managed to convey to me that he wanted to come to the United States to study. So I uh, helped him a little bit, and he managed to get to Dorchester, Nebraska, to finish his senior year of high school. And uh, then... um, he went on to the University of Nebraska. Pardon me, his name is Murtazo Chadyev. And Murtazo uh, one day was visiting with me. We had become good friends, and he was one day visiting with me, and he said, you know, uh, it is not so easy to change cultures. It's not so easy to go from one culture to another. And we got to talking about that, and we said, well, we ought to be, interview some people that have done that and see what kind of challenges they've faced and what kind of opportunities they found in a new culture, what they like better about a new culture, what they don't like as well, and things of that sort. And that's what got us started on that. Mm -hmm. You spend a significant amount of time over there? Yes, I uh, have taught there where I spend a semester at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, stories from yourself in the book? (laughs) Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, of course, in different cultures, you find uh, different things, not just food and language different, but uh, the uh, thing that I was talking to Curtis about earlier, uh, having to do with marriage. You know, uh, I one day was asked to speak to some high school students. They would have been 14 or 15 years old. And one of the boys uh, raised his hand and he asked me, this question. He said, I have heard in America there is a thing called dating. What is dating? So I explained to him. I said, well, a young man, probably 
16, 17, sees a girl, maybe she's 15 or whatever, in high school, and he thinks she's a nice person, so he says, uh, would you like to go to the movie with me at night? And she says, uh, yeah, and so he goes to her home and picks her up, maybe meets her parents, and uh, opens a car door for her and buys her Coke and uh, popcorn, and uh, they go to the movie, and he takes her home and says, I had a nice time. She says, I had a nice time too, and that's dating. <laughs> now then, now then. These kids are just rolling around on the floor. They're laughing so hard. And when I get down, they say, Americans don't really do that, do they? And I say, uh, sure, yeah, sure. Because it was totally foreign to their culture, totally foreign to their custom. Because in their country, many, many of the marriages, not all, but many, many are still arranged marriages, you know. I stayed in a home where I asked uh, my host how he'd happened to marry his wife. And he said, well, his father was a Soviet diplomat, and he was serving in Syria, and he came home on vacation. And he said one Thursday morning at breakfast, he said uh, to me, uh, today we must uh, talk to you about taking care of something on Sunday, because I go back to Syria on Monday, I want this out of the way. Uh, we will have you get married on Sunday. Well, he said up to that moment he had no thought of getting married at all, but now he was going to get married on Sunday. Who shall I marry, Father? Well, uh, your mother and I have chosen three girls that would be satisfactory. Here are their pictures. Pick out one. So he picked out one. He's been married to her for 30-some years now. And it's worked out very well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, cultures are, are, are different. <laughs> And that's not to say that one's better than another, because in their culture, the divorce rate is not as high as in ours. <laughs> but on the other hand, then when maybe women don't have quite the same rights. You never saw a woman driving a car in Tajikistan, for example. You uh, didn't see them as restricted by any means as they were under the Taliban in Afghanistan, not by any means, nor even as they were in, as they are in Saudi Arabia or some of the other Middle Eastern countries, but there were certain things they could not do. Although um, they were active in business enterprises, we had a, a woman come here to uh, the University of Nebraska and spend some time uh, talking to business people here in Lincoln about uh, uh, human resource management. She uh, was the person that handled the hiring and firing at a... Uh, at a uh, mill, well, they made uh, carpets is actually what they made. Uh, they employed about 6,500 people, and she was the person in charge of that. So women had some, some responsibilities. They could do things, yeah. <clears throat> what else? You might... Uh, Ask about some of the other books, I guess. Uh, <laughs> if you, okay. <laughs> what about some of the other books? I wrote a book, a uh, sports story, one time that has to do with uh, two boys that are cross-country teammates and rivals, and it is a book which also has a racial theme to it. One of the boys is African American. One is Caucasian. And uh, the problems they encounter at first, but how they come to resolve those problems. And it's really based on a true story. It's based on experience I had coaching cross-country out in California. And we had very similar kind of problem, and the two guys got to be friends. Yeah. So uh, that's one of them. And then I've <coughs> ghost-written some books. I... Uh, was in Pasadena, California in 1980, and I was visiting with a man named Dr. Harry Tyler. Now, Dr. Harry Tyler was not such a terribly, terribly famous person, although his brother was in educational circles. His brother was named Dr. Ralph Tyler, and Dr. Ralph Tyler had been the dean of the School of Education at the University of Chicago for 35 years, was an eminent, eminent educator. Well, anyway, I got to visiting with Harry the, the brother, and Harry had done some things, too. He had started the uh, Armed Forces educational program that we had during World War II and continues to this very day. 
and he had started the practice of having counselors in schools. So he had had a significant educational impact. Well, he was talking to me about this, and he said, you know, he said, I've written my autobiography, and I've sent it off to publishers, but I can't get anybody to publish it. I, just by way of being nice to him, I didn't think I was going to do anything more than that. I said, well, I'd like to read it, Harry. He said, I'll send it to you. And he did. He sent it to me. And so here it arrived at Doan College, and it was 2,100 single-space typewritten pages. Everything that had ever happened to Harry, he remembered and he put down. Well, that's why he couldn't get it published. There were things in it that were interesting, but, uh, but it had to be edited. I convinced him that we had to do that. He wasn't too keen on doing that. He thought everything he'd done was kind of important. But we did. We managed to cut it down to, I think, 426 book pages, which is still pretty large. But, um, you know, sometimes people do uh, need editors. <laughs> so I really, I, well, I did, uh, I guess you could say ghost wrote it or whatever, or collaborated with him. <laughs> okay, well, thank you.